Good morning. Happy New Year. It's good to see you guys. If I don't have the chance to know you yet, my name is Will Davis Jr. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. I want to greet you guys online as well. If you're here today um, because of a commitment to start the new year in church and pursuing spiritual things, you're in the right place. Thank you for coming. And speaking of Bibles, do we have Bible call today? You guys ready with Bible call back there? Um, I'll give you a minute to get, oh, we were still passing out Bibles though. Yes. Um, if you got them, get them ready. Um, Connie, that's so funny. I actually caught them off guard. I love it. Um, anyway, we'll pass these out in just a second. So I love to point out ACF royalty. And we have two friends today. Where, where are the Sorensen? Stu and Mary Lou, where are you guys? Okay, will you guys stand up just for a second? Uh, and Penelope, this is Stuart, Stuart and Mary Lou Sorensen and their baby girl who's four years old, Penelope. They're ACFers. I'm going to keep this very vague. They serve somewhere around the world doing something really, really cool. And that's all I can tell you. Okay, can we welcome these guys? They are um, they're going to be on our patio. And we're doing the Bible call here at the same time. I apologize about the confusion. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. You guys are two of the cutest people on the planet and the coolest people on the planet. And they really do serve in an amazing area that they can't talk about. And they serve an amazing people group doing an amazing thing that they really can't talk about. Um, and they're ACFers. And they both felt a call to missions coming out of college. And Penelope was born overseas. And um, stop by and see them. They'll be on the patio. Thank you guys. Have a seat. They'll be on the patio after the service. We support them. You support them. They're doing the thing in a part of the world that's not easy to do it in. And so we love you guys. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. And it's really great to see you. Um, okay, we got Bibles out. I apologize about the confusion there. Glad we have Bibles out. Um, we're going to be needing those here in just a second. So we, um, at the end of this month, we have baptism coming up. And um, that's, for a lot of you, a great next step to take if you've become a Christian. The most immediate step after becoming a Christian is baptism. If you read scripture, it's like immediate. And so we'll be baptizing in both services uh, the last weekend of January. And so you can sign up. There should be a QR code behind me. You can sign up online. We'll have a bunch of people that want to do this. We've already got people talking about it and some that have signed up and it'll be an amazing day in our church. We do it once a quarter. So this will be your last chance, I think, till about Palm Sunday. And so if you need to get baptized, don't wait. Because the people that, t if, if, if you're feeling a nudge, it's probably not the devil. Okay, let's just go on that. Tell you, you just be sure it's not Satan telling you to get baptized. It's probably God. Um, let me pray. Lord, thank you for the morning. Uh, thank you for these dear friends online and the folks here in the congregation today. Thank you for the chance to jump in here in January as Sarah on screen talked about to the study of your word and to studying of your word about your word. Um, I pray for the coming weeks to be significant in our lives, Lord, as we begin to really consider where our authority lies, what the moral backstop for our lives is, where we decide truth begins and ends. Is, is anything goes really what's best or is there really a, a law that's written in our hearts that we have to live by and should live by and get to live by? Um, I'm not up to this task. There's no way, Lord, I can do justice to this great topic. It is such an amazing thing you've given us in this book, your word. So I pray you'd help me to rise to the occasion and fill me with your spirit and help us to be ready listeners and learners. Thank you for Stu and Mary Lou Sorensen and Penelope. Uh, thank you for what they've fought through, where they are, and what they, you've done for them and what they're doing for so many amazing people in the place and the planet you have placed them. And I pray they'll feel loved and encouraged while they're here today. Now, Lord, teach, please. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 in just a minute. And again, thank you guys for getting the Bibles out. Genesis chapter 1. Um, I'm, I'm not showing you scripture anymore. Okay, you can boo and hiss at me all you want to. I'll receive it. I'm going to give you addresses, but I'm not going to show you the scriptures. Because I really do want you to be ready to do this. Um, if you want to use a smartphone, that's your call. But I really do want you to have your copy of scripture that you can see, that you can put notes on. Because... The, it's not, just not a good time for Christians not to know the Bible. 
And I, I want to push you to have your copy ready to go. So as Sarah said, you can know it and be ready to quote it. By the way, the, the question that people on video are answering is, the word of God became the word of God to me when? And for Sarah, she said it was here at ACF. Every week of this series, you're going to have somebody representing the congregation talking about that on video and just kind of giving a testimony to how God's scripture became God's scripture to them. Let me put on screen the, the topics for the month. This is a two-month series. It's called The Bible Canceled? Question mark. Has the Bible become irrelevant? Has the Bible been determined to be meaningless? Um, what do we do with the Bible these days? And so that's a, the kind of the question we're trying to answer. Why do we need it in the first place? So next week's topic is what makes Scripture Scripture? Why this over the Bhavigad Gita of Hinduism, or the Book of Mormon, and the additional books of Mormon, or the Quran, or any other wisdom literature, supposedly. Why, what, who defined, who gets to define what scripture is and why? It's next week's topic. The 22nd, um, our need for a moral backstop. Why, why do we need a book that tells us what's right and wrong? Why can't we just figure that out for ourselves? And then we'll baptize on the 29th, and then we'll get into February, and I'll share those topics later. First two weeks of February are objections and questions, objections to and questions about the Bible from you that you've sent me, and then we'll tell you about the rest of the series in a bit. So it's going to be fun. Can't wait. Buckle up. Bring your Bibles. So at the heart of the Yale University campus, um, if it's not geographically the heart of it, it is definitely intended to be a point of attention. It's the Sterling Memorial Library, where students go to study. The Sterling Library was built in the late eight, 1920s for a staggering cost of $17 million, which in the 20s was a ton of money. It was designed by James Gam Gamble Rogers to look like a cathedral. I've got a couple of pictures I'm gonna show you here behind me if I'm not already. It was designed to look like a church. It even has a nave that's called a nave and a chancel that's called chancel. It has an altar that looks like an altar that has a picture of what first appears to be Mother Mary, but then it's actually uh, our alma mater, which means our mother, which is of course Yale University for, in their case. It's a bit... Um, it's a bit of a joke on campus because the time the cathedral, the cathedral library was built, they had just scuttled plans at um, Yale to, to build a new chapel. They had just canceled the requirement for students to attend chapel. They started as a biblically focused place. We're moving away from that more toward a secular institution. They canceled chapel and they canceled plans to build a, a new chapel on campus, so they said, well, we'll build a library. And the architect, Rogers, who was well known for his architecture and his Gothic emphasis, thought it'd be kind of funny to put some religious imagery into this new university library. It's the first building in America to have a stained glass window that wasn't a church. And it was a bit controversial. Were they making fun of religion? Or were they saying that you can't really find out truth without the knowledge of religion? Keep in mind, on the University of Texas campus, our University of Texas tower has etched on it on all four sides, the truth shall set you free. Anybody happen to know who said that? Jesus did in John chapter 8, verse 31. He wasn't talking about learning. So it's interesting, in the center of this highly academic setting, you have this cathedral-like building, and in the cathedral-like building, the library, there are these sculptures making fun of or acknowledging student life. One of the sculptures depicts a student drinking from a mug of beer, remember this is the 1920s, in front of or beneath a curvaceous pinup. It's one of the sculptures. Another one is of a student sound asleep over his books. Another is of a student listening to the radio, which was the distraction of the day. But a fourth sculpture is the one I want to point out today. And as a student with a book open, we'll put it on the screen for you. And the message from the book is, you are 
a joke. Now, that's intriguing or sad or interesting that the cynicism of the search might lead the architect and or the sculptor to come to the conclusion that, look, whatever your point is in trying to figure things out, the bottom line of life, if that was the point, it may just be that it was just humorous. Hey, you're doing all this work, it's a big joke. School's a joke, maybe that's all it was. But clearly there are some who interpret that to mean and some who would believe today. But the point of life is meaningless. There's nothing here. There's nothing that really matters. It's all a big joke. So drink your mug of beer and snooze on your books and do your best because in the end, it's all a big joke. Isn't that the message that a lot of us, especially our kids, are getting today? What are they getting on social media? You don't fit in your body. You don't fit in your gender. You don't fit in your school. You're a joke. This is all a big joke. It's all just, you might as well laugh at yourself and give up because you don't matter. You are a joke. So today we begin a study of a book that says just the opposite. In fact, we're not studying a book, we're studying a library. The Bible's a library. The Bible's a collection of books. 66 of them, like Sterling Library. This is God's library, preserved for us. There are 66 books. There are 32,000, give or take, verses in the Bible, and the 57th one of them, verse 57, early on, says just the opposite of you are a joke. It says you are created in the image of a holy God. That you're eternal. And that because you're created in the image of a holy God, you are infinitely valuable. Later on in Psalm 139, it'll say you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It'll say you're created to rule over creation. You're not a product of creation. You're not a random cosmic accident. You're created on the planet by God to rule over the planet and to rule and reign with him in eternity as one of his children. So, so, the opposite of you are a joke is this. And I want you to hear that today. I want you to hear that this book we're exploring today, and we'll deal with the questions about it, but the book we begin to explore and try to, try to really lift up at Austin Christian Fellowship as something that we need to be under and need to be extremely familiar with tells us that we matter There were not accidents. That we have purpose and mission. And that we're, the, we're the, the tip top of God's creative work. That's the message of this library that we study now. So to build the case for my topic today, which is do we really need a Bible? Why do we need a Bible in the first place? I need to give you five words, but before I give you five words, I need to read what are the first three verses of the library, which are the first three verses of Genesis. So let me read to you, and if you have it, turn there. Genesis chapter one. These have become some of my favorite verses in all scripture. As I've had the chance to really go deep in Genesis one through three, I've taught you a lot about it in the last several years. It has really just move me significantly to think about what these verses teach. So just the first three verses of Genesis chapter one. And I started easy. Genesis is pretty easy to find, by the way. Wait till I get to Haggai, okay? So I can, hopefully you can find Genesis. Go to, go to contents and go right, okay? And you'll find Genesis. Page one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. If my translation is different from yours, that's okay. I'm reading from the New American Standard today. One of the reasons I wanna have you bring your Bibles is to understand there's different translations and that different translations have different goals. And we'll talk about that in our questions part of this. The earth was formless and void, verse two, and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, first recorded words in the Bible, let there be light. And there was light. So the creation of the sun and moon doesn't happen until significantly later. Like day three. So I wrestled a lot, as have many scholars and theologians, and I'm not claiming to be a scholar or a theologian, trust me. But I've wrestled a lot with what that might mean. And one of the conclusions I've come to in reading this is that he's talking about the word, is my first word, revelation. Actually, it's my second word, but I'll get to it in a minute. Is that God's whole point was to make himself known. So when God said, let there be light, he was saying, let everything that happens from this moment forward make me known to my creation. The planets, the nature, the nation of Israel, Jesus, the Bible. I want to be known. So let there be light, let there be disclosure, let there be revelation to the minds and to the eyes and the hearts of my creation that they might know me and thus know that they're not a joke, that they're created in my image. So the five words that I wanna share with you, the first word is the word mystery. I'm gonna walk you through five words that are in descending order to get us to this and you reading it like Sarah did on the screen tomorrow in your quiet time. The first word is mystery. Mystery is that which cannot be known by humans. God is mystery. A mystery is, you'll read a novel or, or a mystery or an Agatha Christie story or some other, like, it's, it's a whodunit. It's trying to figure out what happened. And there's all kinds of mysteries about life. A lot of, a lot of why questions that are about mystery. God exists as a mystery, which means simply, he can't be known by us. He's eternal, he's holy. We're finite and we're unholy and the two cannot meet. If the two were to meet, the holy would consume the unholy. It's a burning, he's a burning, consuming fire. You throw that which is impure in his presence, it gets consumed. God isn't just existing in mystery, God is mystery, he cannot be known. Second word is revelation, let there be light. Revelation is when the, the keeper of the mystery chooses to disclose it. Revelations today about the crime of so-and-so. The White House revealed today that this has been happening. The word revelation means that someone who's been the keeper of the information has decided um, documents have been released and more revelations about the Kennedy assassination back in 1963. The word revelation means that which has been secret and unknowable has been made known. Well, the ultimate revelation is Genesis 1-3. Let there be light. Let God be known. If God doesn't choose to be known, he cannot be known because he's mystery. We can't, we can't get our brains around him. That which is eternal and has no beginning or end blows fuses for me who, because I live in time. And to think of something timeless, I can't, I can't get my brain around it. So without revelation, God revealing himself to us, I will never have the ability to know God. And what I'm telling you from Genesis verse three on, chapter one, the whole thing is God choosing to make himself known to us so we can know him, so we can love him, so we can enjoy him, so we can be with him, so we can know our purposes because of him. So we can know we're not a joke. The second word is revelation, God choosing to make himself known. The third word is inspiration. This is where the Bible begins to creep into the scene. Inspiration happens when God 
enables men and women to accurately record his revelation. Moses, God said, let there be light. Let there be sun and moon. Let there be creatures. Let there be um, birds in the sky. Let there be a man named Abraham who I'm going to call to start a nation of Israel. Inspiration happens when God moves on people in history. And I believe the scriptures teach that inspiration has ceased. So inspiration happened when God moved on people in history, men and women, to accurately record his, sto his story. History. And that inspiration is captured... In this library, we call the Bible. One of the things we're going to do in our objections part of this series is contrast the Bible to, say, the Quran. No offense to Muslim brothers and sisters, but there's a significant difference between what Muhammad gave us in his writings or what Joseph Smith gave us in his writings, the father of Mormonism, versus the 13, 1400-year period of the writings of producings of scripture by men and women, multiple languages, multiple continents, multiple education levels, and this significant unity that comes to bear from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's unique in history. It's unique in his story because it is his story. So we have mystery I mean, by the way, I didn't warn you. I mean, you're going to have to think in this series. If you're looking to be entertained, sorry. We're going to make you think. We have mystery, which is the, the inability to know something. Revelation is the keeper of the mystery, choosing to make it known. Inspiration is, let's get this written down. So listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired. Inspiration, the word inspired is God breathed, is what it means. By God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The, the scriptures, whatever scriptures are, we'll define that next week, are inspired. They're the accurate recording of God's revelation, of God making himself known because he's mysterious. The fourth word is authority. It's God's final word on a subject matter. Authority is a speed limit that you see in knowing there's someone in the city that has the authority, the power to back up that speed limit if you exceed it. It's getting a property tax notice in the mail, which many of us did not long ago, that say this is due to your county this day. Pay it or you're going to have to pay more money. They have the authority to tax us. God is the ultimate authority, and God's word, his scripture, has, is the ultimate authority on all things pertaining to God and humans. So the bigger questions of life, the, this book has the authority to answer those questions. Because it, is, it has authority because it's the accurate recording of God's revelation to us. If it's just my opinion, it has no authority. But the scriptures claim to have authority because they accurately communicate to us what God intends for us to know. That's why he uses the word inspired. Because it's been recorded in a way of God moving through people to make himself known. Did you know this about your Bible? As we dive into this, you're gonna be amazed at how cool this book is. Just as literature by itself, if it weren't even inspired, just as literature, the book is fascinating. It's not literature. Hebrews 4 says it's living and active. If, if you, I was thinking this this morning while I was reading it. Like, you're very likely to encounter the living God if you happen to read this thing. Warning, warning, you might just bump into God here. If you read this, you might just discover, ooh, there's something going on when you read it. It has authority. It has authority to tell you what's right and wrong. This has the authority to tell you what is right and wrong because it's God's accurate revelation to us recorded. 
If it's not from God, it doesn't have that authority. But it's, it, it can say murder is wrong because it's from God. And God is the author of life. He can decide what's right and wrong. It has authority. It has the ability to tell you how to make good decisions. How to wrestle through life's problems. I mean, one of the questions we'll address is that this book isn't relevant <laughs> for 2023. Have you read it? It's a little X-rated in places. I mean, this covers everything that we're dealing with today. So the Bible is authoritative because it is the accurate record of God's revelation. The Bible is God's final word. It's the final word of God and his relationship with humans in history. It tells us how we can know God. It's not one of many sources on that. It's the source. The final word is illumination. The fifth word is illumination. And this is where you come into play. This is what Sarah was talking about in her video. This is what happens to you when you read the Bible and God speaks to you through a specific section of Scripture. We, we sometimes use the word re revelation that God revealed to me in Scripture, but I, I'm going to push back on that word revelation because ultimate revelation is God making himself known through creation and through Jesus, and I believe ultimate revelation has ceased. It's done. When you get Jesus, you don't need any more revelation. You got all you need. What we call revelation is really illumination. It's God taking a passage and showing you something you've never seen before. It's not new truth, it's just new to you. It's not new, beware of the person who says, I have new truth. Beware of that person. Who says, I got the latest word from God and it's extra to this. That's what many prophets today claim to have is we've got the fresh word from God. We've got an, this is a bit outdated. Let me give you the most, most current word from the heavens. No, he's spoken, period. He has spoken, period. Jesus, when he was tempted, said, it is written. It's written, it's said, you will not worship anything but the Lord your God. You will not live by bread alone. It's written, it's said, it's done. Illumination is when you read the scripture and go, oh, wow, boom, that's amazing. And you've all, if you read scripture, have experienced that. I've taught you significantly about what I call the Genesis 3 reality. The Genesis 3 reality was illumination God gave to me on a sabbatical eight years ago, nine years ago, when I read Genesis 1 through 3 almost every day for three months. Now, I begin to see the stark contrast between Genesis 3, where we are, and Genesis 1 and 2, what God intended, and that, that whole illumination of what we live in is not what God intended. I've taught you about the Genesis 3 reality. All that was was illumination of God to me about reality. It wasn't new truth. It was just new to me. So when you open scripture and, and you have that aha moment about you or about a problem, about, about the universe or about something you've been praying about and you get direction, that aha moment is illumination. <coughs> Excuse me. Which you can trust because you're reading an inspired, authoritative source of which there's only one. It's his story. So let me back up again and show you the five. We'll put them on the screen in descending order here. Isn't it interesting? Well, let me just again remind you. So it starts a mystery. God is unknowable, so without revelation, we can't know him, so he chooses to reveal himself. He reveals himself through creation. And creation alone is enough, the scripture says, to make you accountable to God. He chose to reveal himself first through a man, Abraham, and Abraham became a nation, Israel. He revealed himself to all the nations of the world through Israel. And then as a a Jewish person, a man of the nation of Israel, he revealed himself through his son Jesus, who was a Jew. And the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So God's, God's gone very broad revelation to more specific through Israel to ultimate through Jesus, his son. God in flesh. That's all the revelation we need. He then inspired men and women over a 13, 1400, 1500 year period to write down the record of his revelation. And in the three or 400 years after that, 
He moved through the church to collect that revelation. It's called the canonization process. We'll discuss it in our objections time. And he gave us those 66 books, which are the library, which says, you are not a joke. And that library has authority because it's God, it's the record of God's inspired word to us. And when you read it, you get illumined, illuminated. And then, so what happens tomorrow, and this, this is what I want you to get about the weight of this. When you open up this book and you read it, it is the, this what you hold here is the, the resulting process, product of God choosing to make himself known because he was mysterious. You're holding this, reading about yourself because God said, let there be light. And you're holding it. And boy, he's got stuff to say to you about you. I don't know about you guys, but that fires me up. That humbles me. That God would go to such lengths to make sure that we could know him. To why we pass out Bibles in multiple languages to people all over the planet. Think about the life before the printing press. They, they couldn't read a Bible. They had to listen to the priest recite the Bible. And the printing press changed the world because now the Bible is in people's languages. And they could read it for themselves. And as Sarah said in her video, we're the most Bible prolific culture. We have more access to scripture than any culture in history. We're also one of the least informed about it. So why do we need the Bible? Well, first of all, we need a Bible because it tells us the truth about God. There's a lot of, God gets blamed for a lot of things. He gets called a lot of things. He gets placed in lots of locations that may or may not be him. Well, when you have mystery revealed, recorded, and illuminated, and is authoritative, then you begin to get the real story. God does, the scriptures don't hide the stuff about God we don't understand, which is one of the reasons I believe in it. It doesn't paint a picture of a God we want who's always understandable and never lets bad things happen. It paints a picture of the God who is. And in some cases, he's beyond our understanding. His ways are higher than ours, Isaiah says. So you need a Bible because you need someone to tell you where ultimate truth begins and ends, and it does with God. Secondly, we need a Bible because it tells us the truth about ourselves about the human condition. It tells us we're created in the image of God, we're, we're made to love him and know him and be known by him and be loved by him. But as Jeremiah 17, our hearts are deceitful above all things. They've been stricken with that Genesis 3 disease. And our hearts, although they may be telling us certain things about ourselves, are oftentimes misleading us. Our instincts, our impulses, our desires, our thoughts, if not governed by God, will lead us astray. They can't be trusted because they're afflicted with a terrible disease called sin, which caused the first two humans to revolt and rebel before God. If they've been given, they've been given an entire island like Maui to play on and said, here's one tree you can't play with, leave that tree alone. They felt, how dare you tell me what I can't do? And they, they rebelled in their hearts before God and sent it into the whole human race because of it. And our hearts today, look at our culture, are deceiving us and just believing all these things about ourselves that are not true. The Bible tells you the truth about yourself. You're wonderfully made, you're designed to be holy, you're in God's image, but you've got an incurable disease that only he can fix. That's not a popular message. And it tells us the way of salvation. There is a way that this problem can be solved. It begins with God. It does not begin with humans. Religion is what begins with humans. God's plan of salvation begins with God. And it began with revelation. I'm going to make myself known. And I'm going to deal with this issue. And I'm going to take it on personally. You know what the Bible says about you? You know what the Bible says about you guys online? It says you're worth dying for. It, it says you're not a joke. In fact, you're worth dying for. You're worth my son dying for. 
That's the plan of salvation. That whoever believes in Jesus might have eternal life. Jesus said, I, I myself am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't come to the Father but through me. I'm the way. I'm going to build the path to, to God. The Bible is really important, friends, because it dis distinguishes the way to God, not a way to God. One of the things we'll talk about in our objections is, well, aren't there multiple paths to God? What's really funny is the people in those paths, none of those guys are saying that. Muslims don't believe multiple paths to God. Mormons don't believe multiple path paths to God. Hindus don't believe in multiple paths to all the gods. Buddhists don't believe in God at all. It's just the people on the outside saying, well, you know, all roads lead to the same place. <laughs> Sorry. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. So this book tells you what God says the path is. And he says it's narrow. He says you can miss it really easily if you're not paying attention. So we need the Bible because it tells us about God and because it tells us about ourselves and it tells us the way of salvation. So in the spirit of restore, which is our church's effort in this year to encourage our staff and our leaders and our volunteers and you to move at a slower pace than the craziness of culture, I want to go back to the words etched on the UT Tower. Truth sets free. When you understand what matters in life, you'll get off that treadmill. You may find yourself, like our friends the Sorensons, rethinking your life plan once you understand what really matters. But the pull for money and for more and for getting ahead and the pursuit of that, that golden apple which doesn't exist, that golden ring which doesn't exist, at some point, as you, as you read this book, and you hear Paul telling the church in Thessalonica, hey, live quiet lives and work with your hands. Basically, mind your own business. Love God. Be gentle. Outserve your neighbor. It changes what you're pursuing. My bottom line is this. It's on the screen. The Bible is God's inspired record of his self-revelation to man through creation, through Israel, and ultimately through Jesus. Because it's that self-revelation, it is indispensable for discovering what truth is and knowing what your purpose in life is. You simply can't know that without it. Bold claims, right? They're not mine. They're his. Christians, it is time for us to close the gap between our awareness of God's word and where we are today because the gap is broad. You can't make the decisions. You can't be the bright light you're supposed to be, the salt and light. You can't be the moral influence and have the moral stamina to withstand the onslaught of junk that's coming our way. You won't have the conviction to stand firm when someone you love comes to them with the newest truth about who they are or what they are. You won't have the ability to stand on that if you don't have the moral backdrop, which I'll talk about in two weeks, behind you, the backstop. That's from God. He gets to decide what morality is. We don't. So the goal of this series is not just to familiarize you with the Bible, it's to, it's to help you to begin to get motivated to close the gap. There are no better times spent in your day than you spend over the scriptures letting God prepare you for the rest of your day. It is the most important moment or moments of your day. And I, as your pastor, implore you and I'm heating this up in me in 2023 to heat it up in you in 2023 because we can't survive without it. A year ago, I stood on this stage with a backpack on my back and said, are you ready? Talked about what you need in your backpack. Well, here you go. Will you commit to be a man or woman 
of the word. Let's pray. You guys listened really well. Thank you. Father, I pray now that you'll take this church and help us to agree together to be very serious about knowing this gift you've given us called the Word of God. I thank you that you moved out of mystery to make yourself known. Father, I pray for those today who feel intimidated by this book, that they'll make the choice to start just one verse at a time, one chapter at a time, and chip away. And they'll find moments with you life-changing when they do. I pray we'll have the courage to stand under this scripture and not put our opinions next to it as equal to it, but to understand our hearts above all things are deceitful. They will mislead us. And we have to have an objective source that given to us by you that tells us what truth is. Otherwise, we will not find it. And we're very likely to be led astray. Lord, I pray for a stirring in people's spirits right now to decide to become fluent in this book. Fluent in it. That they might be a go-to for others. Lord, forgive us for all the times we spent trying to get better abs. <laughs> or better portfolios. And yet we neglect our spirits through the reading of your word. Lord, we, we commit the next several weeks to you and ask you to make them transformational. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Prayer leaders, you wanna come forward? You guys online, we love you. We'd love to see you here in the house. We did a series here at ACF a few years ago called Get Off the Couch. Maybe you wanna get off the couch and come join us next weekend. We'd love to see you here, if you can. We'd love to have you.